probably already loaded. So we're so if I just type the port on my laptop, it's going to explode it. And it's starting to go. Does it mean it's starting? It's loaded. It's closed. Do it on your laptop, it'll take get some time. It'll take a second because it's gonna have to download additional So it so I typed in library car and it said it wasn't found. And then the weird the weird something weird happened when I saved it. It said car is not a part of this R version. Do you want it to install? Like after I click save, it didn't let me save it. It did the card. Okay, that was it here. Hopefully it installed it. I think it did, but um it's, I didn't do that with the first thing. Okay. All right, so got some time where we left off. Uh, leaves data set. So we got length and we have widths. All right. What we wanted to do is do a nine, bootstrapped 95% confidence interval and a parametric confidence interval. So kind of do those both together. Right, of length. So we're going to do that of mean of length. And then for width, we're going to try uh, the variance. Now, we didn't learn how to do a, a parametric confidence interval for variance. Uh, for that, we would have to use chi square distribution. And it's a little bit more um, more involved to calculate that, uh, which is it's so rare that you actually do it that I don't think there's a point in like showing you how to do it. Uh, but we're, we'll still practice doing the 95% confidence interval of the standard deviation. Then. So some of you probably finished it up before you left. Some may still need you to practice doing it. We're going to do standard deviation. Yeah, I meant to do standard deviation. So yeah, instead of calculating the mean, we're going to be doing standard deviation. And we're going to bootstrap it, and we're going to get all of those bootstrapped replicates of the standard deviation itself, and not the mean. So, you, so just replace the standard deviation function as opposed to like for the mean?
Okay. Ooh, I saw the red. Okay. Uh, it was fine, but not. Mm -hmm. Okay, which one is correct? The first one. Like this. Okay. Yeah. So did you you read in the data file, right? These. Why don't you go back and read all that? That's just generating new data. Yeah, so yeah, run that. And now let's try that. Oh. Oh. Leaves that X at the data frame. What vector are we going to use? Dollar sign. And, uh, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, so, yeah, so we got Oh, did you change leaves? I think it's me. Okay, let's read the leaves in again. Read it in. We don't need this because we're not generating like new, new data frame at all. So let's just take that, that chunk out. All right. So now this two leaves, but it's not of the data frame. We're of a we're doing a single variable, right? Yep. Okay. And then that means right down there, you're also going to have. To Just type in your line one. Just cut, just hit the copy that and paste it right in there. And now it's going to be so why that's getting red, I don't know. Okay, so let's cut that real quick. Oh, yeah, it's just to delete that chunk. Maybe that's not too much work. Returning it, so every time you change, you do it, it's, it calculates it. I don't know why it keeps showing red. Maybe save it and then try it, then, then run it again. All right, so that's. Here's my R. I guess if anyone had a question, they would have asked. All right, so I read in my data set leaves. All right, we got two variables, length and width. All right, so first thing I'm just going to do is calculate my parametric 95% confidence zone. That was our mean of that length variable. So leaves dollar sign length, plus our QT, which we want two and a half percent, ninety-seven and a half percent, with the the degrees of freedom, 
of our length, minus 1, and then we're going to multiply it by the standard error. Now, I already ran the standard error, because that's in the chunk right at the beginning, so the function is accessible. So when I run the parametric confidence interval, that's what I get, 40.6 all the way up to 41.3. All right, so that assumes that our underlying data is normally distributed. But we don't know that, right? We can run a QQ plot and see if it is normally distributed, or we'll just say, let's run a bootstrap confidence interval. So with this interval, I first calculated the mean. This is my mean.obs, the observed mean. Do we really need it? Not really. Not really, but I make it a habit to do it. And then I make my empty vector, my null vector, R mean. That's going to hold all of our bootstrap means. Then I'm going to do 4i in 1 to 10,000. I'm going to sample from that length vector with replacement. So bootstrapping is all about sampling with replacement. And I'm going to save that vector as R vec. That's my bootstrapped vector. And then I'm going to do the mean of that vector mean of R vec, and I'm going to save it in that R mean vector, and I want it in the I row. And I'm, at the end, I'm just going to run the quantile R mean, and having something like this as the output just kind of confirms that it's going to work. All right, I don't know if it actually is giving me the, the correct value or not, but at least I get some output, because I don't want to hit play and then you know, have the green line show up and then nothing. And then you're going to be left with, well, did it work or did it not work? And at least with the quantile, it shows that it worked. So you can see with my quantile, my 95% confidence intervals, I get 40.6 all the way up to 41.3. Pretty close to the parametric values. What was yours? Close? Yep. Mine are very close. Pretty close. Now, if I drop this down and just do, let's say, 10 samples, now you're going to see some, some really crazy changes. Every time I run it, I'm getting different values. It's going to be all over just because with sample size of 10, we're introducing a lot more luck. Uh, if we use 10,000, if we do use 100,000, it tries to balance out the luck. Makes our confidence intervals uh, much closer to our parametric confidence intervals. All right, any questions? So with, as I said, this bootstrapping, you can do it with any statistic that you want. Any statistic. Certain statistics might be a little bit more involved. Um, and if you need some of those, please come talk to me. I'll help you. Uh, but one of, the, one of the ones we could do, just as, as practice, as a demonstration, I said, let's do standard deviation. So I copied and pasted the code, pasted, you know, got it into this chunk, and then I updated some stuff. So instead of mean.obs, we're doing sd.obs, standard deviation observed. All right. And for that, I'm going to do sd of the leaves dollar sign width. Then I change my vector, so now it's RSD, so randomized standard deviation. And the vector is basically going to be the same thing I updated with, because right, we're working with the width variable. But instead of the mean, then, we're going to do SD of that R vector. And everything else is basically the same. All right, we generated our bootstrap strap vector calculated the standard deviation, saved it, and repeated it over and over and over again, so that my RSD now is a vector of a thousand values. So when I run it, I get that standard deviation. And you can see, standard deviation, the observed is 1.43, 1.44, I guess rounded, and this interval captures it. That's a 95% bootstrap standard deviation. We could do variance if we wanted. We could do median if we wanted.
Not bad. So the homework assignment kind of gives you more practice doing this. Um, the homework only has you do the means, because that is usually what we're doing. Right? And it has you doing parametric and bootstrapping. So make sure you work through it, make sure you, you feel comfortable doing it because this will be on the exam. All right. And we know the process. We know we pick out what test statistic we want to do, create our null vector, make our bootstrapping loop, all right? And then we use the quantile function to get that 95% confidence interval. All right? quantile of our t distribution. So what we are doing, I did the QT in the help file. This gives us our students t distribution. Uh, and QT right down there, let me scroll down. So the p is the, ve is the vector of probability. So we're looking at the 2.5% and 97.5% and that gives us our cutoffs. So the very first, that 2.5%, we're saying, what point in our T distribution gives us 2.5% area underneath that tail, that tail? So whatever that is, whatever that QT gives us, that's what it is. And then 97.5% is what, what value gives us 97.5% to the left of that point? That's our cutoffs. And you'll, you'll learn that that's also our cutoffs for a T test. Any other questions? Nope. How useful is Google with this? So I did a search, bootstrap 95% confidence intervals in R. And you get a lot. You get a lot of this. Quick R is very useful. Our bloggers, very useful. They do a lot of demonstrations. But here's the issue, is that a lot of these, including I think some of the YouTube videos, they utilize the boot package. So the boot package is a very, I'm going to say a very refined randomization package. Right? It does the boot, it's much more efficient in bootstrapping, it's much more efficient in randomization tests, all right, than what we can do. We didn't optimize our randomization, but for us, we don't really care because this stuff that we do finishes in less than a second, all right? But the boot package kind of does it, does the iterations for us, and you can kind of follow along, but it's actually pretty detailed. There's quite a few more steps than what we just did in our script right here. So just this, pretty easy, pretty simple. To do this, you have to first create your boot object. So this is, that's for an R squared value. Oh, never this, this is, I guess R squared, that's correlation coefficient. Coefficient of determination, I should say. All right, you have to actually make a formula of the object that you, that you want. So like this R squared, you actually had to do your fit and then kind of pull out the R squared value. Uh, and this is all fine because when you run the boot procedure, it's gonna happen, it's gonna do it a whole lot faster than what we could have normally have, have done it. Uh, and then the boot.ci kind of gives you histograms that, that we can look at our histograms of all of our bootstrap values. And you can see how a lot of times some of our values, they're not normally distributed. And, and if our underlying statistic isn't normally distributed, then you wouldn't expect it to be. Uh, so just know that if you were on, an, uh, on a test 
or doing your homework and you say, how do I do this again? Know that when you do a search, you're going to get a lot of examples on how to do it using the boot package. And that means that you probably would be better to go ahead and look up the videos, look up the notes that we did, look at the actual code, and modify the code that, that I showed you. All right? This one might be a little bit better. Let's see what their code is. Quantiles. T test. There's your there's your QTs. That's what the QT comes up with. Those black lines. Right. Where's the bootstrap? Did it not do bootstrapping? Guess not. But be aware. Be warned. All right. Move on. Uh, I have homework due on Wednesday. By the end of the day, that's fine. Uh, I do say that try to work on it because if you have questions, if you run into errors, we can answer them in class on Wednesday. All right, let's move to hypothesis test. This is kind of where we've been going and trying to do. What we're going to do is start with a simple hypothesis, the hypothesis test. All right, and by mean of simple, it's going to be our one sample test. We have a sample, we calculate a mean. Is our mean equal to some value? Or we found an item. This is its its length. Does this in, does this individual belong to our group? Is it part of our species? So. All right, so these are what I call simple, uh, simple type of hypothesis tests. So before we get into these, there are five items to report whenever you do a, a hypothesis test. Obviously, you're going to have to report the conclusion or the interpretation. All right, and that's going to be more of like our uh, biological interpretation. So with all of our stuff. Anything that we do, we have like a biological question, and from that biological question, we, we develop a statistical question. That conclusion interpretation should be statistical question slash biological question answer. So if we were interested in, you know, do the wing lengths differ? Your conclusion interpretation should answer that question. All right? Second item to report is our statistical test. What test did you perform? The third item is going to be our p-value. All right. Our fourth item will be the test statistic, and our fifth item is the degrees of freedom. All right. So I do mark a couple of these as optional. Some of our tests will not have a test statistic. All right. Some of our tests don't have a test statistic. Maybe it's because we're testing the mean. So if it didn't have a test statistic, then it's going to be optional. Some of our tests don't have a degrees of freedom, like our randomization tests. They don't have a degrees of freedom because we didn't make any assumption about the underlying data and we developed our own null distribution. All right, so those are listed as optional. Conclusion statistical test p-values, those are all going to be required. If your test has test statistic and degrees of freedom, those are also required. Now, what about our rounding for the p-value? You've probably seen p-values written in papers, probably in other classes, and maybe you wondered, okay, when do you round? When do you don't? What are those rules? Well, here's our set of rules. Anytime our p-value is greater than 0.05, we're just going to round to the hundredths place. All right? No need to get any finer detail. We don't need it. All right? If we're greater than 0.05, we know that our test statistic is possibly obtained through random chance. So there's no difference, no effect, no difference uh, in our means. There are, our individuals belong to the group and so forth. If we are between 0.05 at the high end and 0.001, now we're in our significance. We have a difference. All right? If we're between 0.001 and 0.05, we go to three digits. So now it's kind of important. If you have 0.049, you report 0.049. If you 
If you have 0 0.041, you report 0 0.041. All right? If we are between 0 0.0001 and 0 0.001, do that again. 0 0.0001 and 0 0.001, we go to four digits. All right? Anything less than 0 0.0001, we just report the p-value as being less than 0 0.0001. All right? We don't need to see 5 times 10 to the negative 24. We don't need to see that. It's smaller than 0 0.0001. The amount... What our p-value is doesn't tell us anything about our data being more significant or less significant. For us, it, we put a hard line at 0.05. If it's greater than 0.05, there's no difference. If it's equal to or less than 0.05, we have a significant difference. All right? So if you run a test, if, if Nate and I run a test, two different tests, and I get 0 .00, or I get 0 .04, and he gets 0 .0001. It doesn't mean that his data are more significant than mine. Both of them are significantly different. All right? So here's our round, these are our rounding rules. Optional items. Exact tests that we'll run usually lack test statistics, and they usually lack degrees of freedom. We're going to run a binomial test where we can actually calculate the true, the actual probabilities of getting data more extreme, uh, or as extreme or more extreme. Randomization tests, they lack degrees of freedom. We make no assumption about the null distribution. So this is why they were optional. So we're going to start with this, continuous variable, and we're going to test for means. So are the means, is the mean equal to some value or not? All right? So is x or is the mean of x different from some prescribed value? That's our question. We've got two options. One is a z-score, and the second is a one-sample t-test. The z-score is pretty uncommon, and it's uncommon because you need the population variance. You need the population standard deviation, and typically you don't have that. All right. But if you do have it, then you run a z-score. Now, what types of questions would this answer? It's one right up here. A sample of acorns, n equals 25, has an average length of 15.8. Is this average different from the average acorn size of the species? And then I write, for this species, acorn size is normally distributed with a mean of 18.7 and a standard deviation of 2.9. Our population is the species. We have that information. In order to answer this question of, is our mean equal to the average of the species, we use a z-score test. Most of the time, though, we don't. We don't have that population standard deviation. And because of that, we don't do a z-test. We actually do a t-test. All right? And it all comes down to the test statistic. That's what it comes down to. So similar type of question. The average acorn species, the, the average acorn size for a species of oak is 18.7. Note I didn't say what the population level was. If you collected a sample of acorns with a mean of 15.8 and a standard deviation of 2.2, then is your sample average smaller than the predicted species of oak? Note the different ways in which I ask a question. Basically, the questions are the same. Is the mean equal to some prescribed value? The difference between these two comes down to that population level standard deviation. If we know it, then it's a z-score test. If we don't know it, it's a t-test. All right? The other aspect is how I phrase the question. So in that first question, I ask, are they different? In the second question, I ask, is our sample average smaller? All right? That, those are two very different questions. And it gets to this idea of, are we going to run a two-tailed test, or are we running a one-tailed test? Well, what is this bit about the tails? Well, it comes down to that area under the curve that we're interested in, all right? We mentioned how we develop our null hypothesis, all right? And we always say our null hypothesis is that there's no difference. And in, in most cases, our null hypothesis is, is that our sample is part of our population. It's the alternative hypothesis that, that we're interested in. 
So if our alternative hypothesis is that they're just not equal to each other, then we're going to run a two-tailed test. So our statistical questions of interest. Is the mean of A equal to the mean of B? Our alternate would be the mean of A is not equal to the mean of B, which means our means, mean A could be larger than B, or mean B could be larger than A. So when we calculate our p-values, we are focused in and have to include the possibility that both of them could be larger than the other. So A could be larger than B, and maybe we'll be up at the upper tail. Or B could be larger than A, and we'll be at a lower tail. All right? So now our 5%, that alpha level of 0.5%, is going to be divided equally between our upper and lower tails. We still have 5% in our tails. If, however, we set direction into our alternate hypothesis. Now, our null is still that they're equal. Our alternate is that A is greater than B, or perhaps that B is greater than A. In that case, because we set direction, we need all 5%, all of that 5% in our tails, to be in a single tail. The effect of this is it changes where our acceptance region and rejection regions are. In our rejection regions for this two-tailed test, you can see our values here. Get over here, cursor. It's around there. So maybe, I don't know, five and a half up to maybe 10 and a half. All right, that's our cutoff. So if our differences in the mean are exceed those regions, then, you know, hey, we reject our claim. They're different. But here, we've, we've changed it. So now, all of our 5%, instead of that 10.5%, now it's at 10. So if A is greater than B by, let's say, 10 units, now we know that we have a difference. We still reject our null hypothesis, and we conclude that our alternate is, is true. Or at least, we accept, we conditionally accept our alternate hypothesis. All right, so one tail versus two tails kind of comes down to where's our 5 to 5%? Five is it going to be in both tails, or is it only going to be in the one tail? So we're going to start with z-score test. All right, even though it's very uncommon, we still introduce it. So here's our, our, here's our question. Sample of acorns has an average length of 15.8. Is the average different from the average acorn size? For the species, acorn size is 18.7, and standard deviation is 2.9. So this was in that in one of those early slides. All right, so what do we know? We know the sample size, 25. We know our sample size of 25. We know our mean. Our sample mean, X bar, is 15.8. We know that. We know our population mean, mu, that's 18.7, and we know our population standard deviation, 2.9. Now remember, if we did our sample mean, our x bar minus the mu divided by standard deviation, that gets us to a normal 0, 1. It gets us to a z, right? Well, if we're working with the sample, we need to use standard error of the mean, which is our population standard deviation divided by our sample size. Right? The standard deviation of the mean is the standard error of the mean. So that means then, is when we apply this, it still approximates a normal 0, 1 distribution, which is our Z, hence the name Z-score, all right, Z-score test. So our statistical hypothesis then is that if we apply, so our statistical hypothesis is that our means are equal, but the way we get to testing it is if we apply this transformation, if we subtract our means and we divide by the standard error of the mean, then if they're equal, we should be at zero. All right? We should follow a normal distribution of zero and one. If they're not equal, then we shouldn't be equal to, to zero. And this is where our, our, our probability, our p-values comes into play. If, if they're actually equal, every time we create a sample, we're going to get a slightly different value. So whatever observed value we get, Whatever observed Z is that, that, that this gives us, our sample gives us, how likely is it that we could get a value as extreme or more extreme just by chance alone? 
and that gives us now the area under the curves. So, this is what our p-value is doing. We saw 15.8 and 18.7, all right? This up here. All right, our sample mean, 15.8. Our population mean, 18.7. The difference is equal to what? Two point nine? All right, so our difference is 2.9. We didn't set direction, right? We just said, are they equal or are they different, right? So this is a two-tailed test, which means our low side can be 2.9 units away from the mean, which is 15.8, or we could be 2.9 units above that value which is 21.6, all right? So what we're doing here, here's our normal curve. All right, so this is our population mean, 18.7. That's where it's centered at. All right, what we're looking at is the area under the curve, 15.8 and beyond. So that's as extreme or more extreme. And we're going up to 21.6. As extreme or more extreme. All right, so how do we do that? This is what we said. Well, we're symmetric around the mean. We introduced that conversion. We've already done that conversion, right? So we're going to do our area less than 15.8, and then we're going to add it, the area greater than 21.6. All right? So this is how I did it by hand. We used everything that, that we've been doing by hand, but we can also do it in R, right? So calculate the area by using R. All right, see what we get, all right? What, I should say, what function do we use to get those areas? Down here, P norm. All right, let's get our p-value.
get it? <clears throat> Almost. What was your answer? So, if we're using P norm, all right, and I've got to, we've got to clarify this stuff. Because when we do these z-score tests and we have a sample, all right, we are working with the standard error, all right? The standard deviation of a mean of a population is the standard error of the mean of the population, which means we can't just use the standard deviation that's given in the problem. We actually have to divide by the square root of our sample size, the size of our sample, all right? So in this z-score test, all right, this example, this testing, is our if our sample mean is equal to this population mean, all right? Our alternative is that it's not equal. So is this a one-tail or a two-tail test? Two-tail test, all right? So we account for both of our tails. We have to figure out how far away we are from the mean and then go that unit below and that unit, that number of units above. So we already did that on the board. So I know I have 15.8. So first up, I'm going to do my lower tail. I use P norm, 15.8, all right? The distribution that we're working with is a mean of 18.7. The standard deviation is 2.9 divided by the square root of 25. This is our standard error of the mean. We have to do that. That's very important. All right? And lower dot tail equals t because we want that lower tail. But then we also need the upper tail because this is a two-tail test. So our upper level is 21.6. It's the same number of units away from our mean. So it's 21.6. We still have the mean of 18.7, the standard deviation is 2.9, divided by the square root of 25, the square root of our sample, and then lower dot tail, tail equals false because we want that upper tail. And then when I do it, I get a really small p-value, 5.7 times 10 to the negative 7. All right? So what's our conclusion? Yep, so it's less than 0.05. We reject our null hypothesis that they're equal, which means that they're not equal, right? They're not equal. So how do we report it? And this is kind of, you know, part of our, uh, uh, part of this class is learning how to report our data. So here's my write-up. There is little evidence to suggest that our sample is from the known species of oak. So this is one way and we could have said, yeah, the mean of our sample does not equal the mean of the, of the species. That's, that works. That's a conclusion. In this case, I went the next step with the interpretation to say, yeah, there's little evidence to suggest that our sample is one of these known species of oaks. All right? Remember those five things we have to report. Conclusion or interpretation. There it is. That was my statement here. What test was run? A z-test. That's what we ran. Our p-value. Note my rounding. It was 10 to the negative 7. I don't need to go that, that small. I can just say p is less than 0.0001. That's enough. It lets the reader know it's small. All right? I don't have a test statistic because what we did was just compare the means. Right? And the means will likely be compared, will likely be reported someplace else. All right. We don't have degrees of freedom because our test doesn't have a degrees of freedom. We calculated the area under the curves, and that was our p-value. Questions? So, I, 
kind of did it the longer way, kind of how we did it in our example or on, on our exam. But we know the normal distribution is symmetric around the mean. So if I know that 15.8 is less than my 18.7, what I can do is calculate the area of this tail and then multiply by 2 to get the both areas. And that's what I have up here, is that that's what I did. Calculated the area using the p-norm, all right, and then just multiply by 2. And this works. But if it was a one-tail test, let's say our question here was, you know, our sample was 15.8, the population is 18.7, and I ask, is our population, is our sample smaller than the population? Well, now it becomes a one-tail test, and I don't, I don't multiply by two. I only look at this one area, at this one tail. That's it. All right? All right, practice. We'll do this practice, and then once we finish out these practice, uh, these two practice problems, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. All right? So these are two of them. Yeah, we're going to be doing our z-test. Right. Uh, first up, a sample of six crickets has a mean tarsus of 19.6 millimeters. This particular species has a mean tarsus of 17.9 and a standard deviation of 2.5. So does our sample belong to the species? All right. And number two, male western spotted skunks weigh about 535 grams with a standard deviation of 105. You collected a male spotted skunk that weighs 635 grams. Is this individual larger than a western spotted skunk? All right. For these, I want you to do the hypo write the hypotheses down, the null and the alternate hypotheses. Calculate the p-value and then have a sentence write-up where you report the required, you, know, you, you, have, you list those required items.
these, we always look to see where our sample mean is relative to the population mean. Our p-value is as extreme or more extreme. So as extreme or more extreme could be to the left of our point if our sample mean is below the population mean, or it could be to the right if our sample mean is larger than our population mean. If I don't set direction, then we have to do both. We have to do upper and lowers. It's always a good habit to make sure you know what your null and alternate hypothesis is, because no matter what, our p-value is we either fail to reject the null hypothesis or we reject it. So in R, I don't really know how to make our x bar actually have a bar over it in this, this type of format. If you want it to appear in like the Word document, we're learning how to, I'm, I've learned how to do that, that part. But x bar is equal to mu, that's our null hypothesis. All right, so in this case, we're saying 19.6 is equal to 17.9. 17 now, we know the numbers aren't equal, all right? 17.9 and 19.6, they're, they're not the same, but the idea is if we took a repeated sample, this 19.6 is going to be different, all right? So we're trying to say, well, are they equal? And the variation is just due to random chains. So we're going to do p-norm, 19.6, population mean, 17.9, standard deviation is 2.5, divided by the square root of our sample size, which was six samples, all right? And because our 19.6 was greater than 17.9, we're going to use lower.tail equals f. We want that upper tail. Our sample means above that population mean, we need the upper tail. Going to do that, and since we also want the lower tail, I'm just going to take advantage of the property that our, no, our normal distribution is symmetric and multiply that probability by 2. And I get 0 0.09578254. So the write up that I could use is our sample appears to belong to the species. That's my conclusion. The test that we ran was a z test, p value. Less than 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So I included all the, all three, all the things that I needed to. Minus the optionals, because the optional ones aren't part of this test. Practice problem number two, same null hypothesis, x bar is equal to mu. Or in this case, our individual, x, is equal to mu, since we have a single individual. But you can also use x bar because we're just basically saying it's the mean, but our sample is sample size one. All right? So we're saying x is equal to our mean. And in this one, we said direction. So our x is actually larger than, than mu. So we're going to use p norm, 635. That's our sample. Mean is 535, our population. Standard deviation is 105 divided by the square root of 1. All right? If you just get into the habit of always doing divided by the square root of our sample size, then it kind of makes sense. When we divide by the square root of our sample size of 1, this transformation gives us the z. All right? We're going to use lower.tail equals false because, again, 635 is above the population mean. 
So the p-values are as extreme or more extreme, which means we need that area to the right. And I don't multiply by 2 because it's a one-tail test. So for this one, I get 0.17. So this individual, or my write-up would be this individual is not larger than the western spotted skulls. Z-test, p is less than or equal to 0 0.17. Now, I use less than or equal to here. Could I have just written, put equal to? Yeah, I could have. This one, I use uh, less than 0.1 just because, you know, we round it up. I'm just being a little bit more specific, probably it's attention to detail, but do you have to do that? Not really. You could have just said P is equal to 0.1, or P is equal to 0.17. Those would work. And I have that in our handouts. So you can see I actually included our null and alternate hypothesis, right? code for the R. Right. And then I did another write, uh, another write up. All right, same type of deal. It's our conclusion interpretation based on the p value. Our test is e test and our p value itself. Same thing here again. Note I did x is equal to mu and x is greater than mu. There's, it's our, it's still x bar, but we're working with a sample of size one, and we still divide divided by the square root of one. So our skunk is not larger than the Western Spotted Skunk, Z-Test, and our P. All right? So why do we use it? We use this if we're going to compare a single value or a collection of, value, of, of values. So a sample mean to a population value. We know our population mean, and we know our population standard deviation. We don't have to estimate it. All right? So when we do that, then we generate our p-values using a normal table, or for us, we're going to use r to get using that p-norm function to get our p-value. And remember, it's our p-value is going to be the probability of getting data as extreme or more extreme than what we expect, given the our, given what is in our problem. So given the information about the population. When we do that, when we do our conversions, we get that z-score, hence the name, z-test. And I do have here, don't forget to divide the standard deviation by the square root of our sample size. That's important. All right? And if we're doing a two-tailed test, multiply the probability by two. If we don't, if it's a one-tailed test, just leave it alone, whatever R gives us. And then for the reporting for this, we report z-test or z-score test. We report the p-value and then our conclusion and interpretation. All right? That's your first statistical test. Our assumption is that our data are normally distributed. So we'll stop here for today. On Wednesday, we will answer questions about the homework. That's our bootstrapping stuff, confidence intervals. We'll do a quick review. We'll review this slide, and then we'll move to our t-test, which hopefully you can guess that we don't have our population state or deviation. So we have to approximate it, which means we no longer follow as a normal distribution. All right. If you have questions about the homework, you can email me or save them for class. Random question. If 0.05 is our cutoff for our p-value, that's probably going to determine whether we accept or reject the goal. Why do we have to run? Why do we have to round? What do you mean round? So like with the p values that we've got, we've rounded them to the nearest hundred. Mm -hmm. So like if we accept it, we're going to say, no, it's greater than 0.05. You could. Some people do. Some people would give p is greater than 0.05. And and we'll see that in the grad stats, or even in, in, in the ANOVA, when we do our postdoc tests and start to compare multiple groups, sometimes it's easier just to say all of the means are different and we give the smallest of the p-values. Say all the p-values are going to be greater than point, let's say point 0.1. And we, we could do that. Uh, I, I just like saying the actual p-value because it gives us an idea of how extreme, how extreme or less extreme it is. Uh, because like with a sample size of 6, if we had a p-value of 0.055, technically it's greater than 0.05. 
we had failed to reject it, but did we have enough power to actually detect the difference? Because we only had a sample of size six. That's kind of how I look at it. I bet not everyone does that, but I've also done good stats. Yeah, yeah. I read that, read that in papers. But if you had a sample size, you know, 300, and you get a p value, and you just report p is greater than 105, no one's really. How do you, how do you evaluate standard because we are comparing our sample to a population. So remember when we did when do we report standard deviation versus standard error? Right? If we do a repeated sample, we get a standard error because our standard deviation is going to change. So what we're going to have to do is kind of approximate that that standard error. Well, in this case, we don't approximate it. We actually get calculated directly because we know the population standard deviation because we divide it by our sample size. And that's also standard. The standard deviation, the variance is going to change based on our sample size and by dividing by our sample size. And okay. Thank you. You're gonna see it. I mean, we've already done it, right? Yeah. All right. To calculate the standard errors, and that's what that's what that is. Standard deviation over the square root gives us a standard. Okay. In this case, we did our, our sigma. For the t-test, we're using s, the sample standard deviation. Because so we're approximating. We're approximating. Okay. And that's why we have we have used the follows the t-distribution test. Hence the t-test.